Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me tonight as we uh, get into God's Word. We're going to be looking at uh, a lot of Second Chronicles. We're going to be talking about the son of Asa, whose name is Jehoshaphat. Before we do that, though, we're going to spend some time worshiping. Uh, the lyrics are going to be on the screen for each of these videos. Then after the message, so we'll do some worship. We'll have a message after that. Uh, stick around. We'll do communion as well. And um, then a final song. And yeah, so that's kind of be kind of the flow for tonight. Before we do that, I wanted to start tonight by reading uh, Psalm 145. This is one of my favorite Psalms. It's a Psalm that I want read at my funeral. Um, and it's, it's a really important Psalm where we remind ourselves who the Lord is, what he's done, what he's going to do. And, um, yeah, I think it's really important for, uh, the times that we're living, living in, as, uh, you know, the world is kind of in uh, upheaval uh, to a degree. So let's go ahead. We're going to read this. This is Psalm 145. Then I'll pray and we'll get into the worship. Okay. So Psalm 145 this is from the New American Standard, starting in verse one. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all. And his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. And your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall, and he raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him, and he will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you. God, we bless you for all of your incredible works. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending 
your son to be the savior of the world. Thank you for the way Jesus reflects exactly who you are. You are our faithful king. Help us tonight to draw near to you in sincerity. And God, thank you that you are near to those who do draw near to you in sincerity. By your Holy Spirit, let that happen. Correct us where we need correcting. God, encourage us where we need encouragement. Help us to be faithful to you as you are to us. And let your name, Jesus, let it be glorified. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I remember those melodies, the words we sang when I first believed. Songs of redemption, stories of hope, heaven awaken inside my soul. I sing in Christ alone, my solid ground. like a river love so divine those words kept singing through the darkest night sweet hymns of freedom
never moving like a mountain never ending like the sea like a sunrise bringing blue skies your light is all around me though i'm prone to leave your side you chase me like the tide you are constant in my wandering you are Waking or sleeping 
thy presence my life Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word I child so let's get into our scripture okay so if you have a bible uh we're primarily going to be in second chronicles uh but just to kick us off i want to share a scripture that kind of um you could say rings throughout the entire uh all the chapters that we're going to be reading in second chronicles about first Asa and then primarily his uh, son Jehoshaphat. Um, but this passage is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is Paul. And starting in verse 14, Paul says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Now, this is uh, also unequally yoked. Don't be unequally yoked. Same thing. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has has the temple of God with idols. For we, talking about believers in Jesus, we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This is a passage that you're going to see um, holding true throughout uh, the passage in Second Chronicles and is so relevant for today. Do not be partners with unbelievers. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Light has no fellowship with darkness. The temple of God has no fellowship with with idols. Okay. Just really keep that in mind tonight. 
All right, so let's start. We're going to go to Second Chronicles, uh, starting in chapter 15, verse 1. So we're looking at uh, Jehoshaphat's dad first. His name is Asa. Asa. Now, Asa is a good king. He starts off very well. And um, he comes into power, verse 1 of chapter 15. Now, the Spirit of God came on Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. This is a prophet. He went out to meet Asa, and he said, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him... He will let you he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For many days Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord God of Israel and they sought him and he let them find him. In those days there was no peace to him who went out, or to him who came in, for many disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. Nation was crushed by nation, and city by city, for God troubled them with every kind of distress. But you, be strong, and do not lose courage, for there is reward for your work. So Asa hears this, this call to faithfulness, to undivided loyalty, loving loyalty to the Lord God. And Asa, whose name means doctor, keep that in mind for later in Hebrew, he plays the part of a good physician in a sense because he calls the nation to spiritual health. So when he hears the words of the prophecy um, from Azariah, Asa, Asa in verse 8 says he took courage and he removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and from Benjamin. Then he restored the altar of the Lord, which was in front of the porch of the Lord. So he removes all the idols he restores the altar of the Lord. And then go to verse 16. This is an incredible show of loyalty to Yahweh. It says, And he also removed Maaka, the mother of King Asa, from the position of queen mother, because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah, and Asa cut down her horrid image, crushed it, and burned it in the brook at Kidron. That's powerful. It kind of is reminiscent of Jesus' words in Matthew 10, Luke 14, about like, if you love your mother or father more than me, you're not worthy of me. Well, Asa says, no, mom, not. Nah. We are not going to have this undivided loyalty to Yahweh. You know, we, what harmony has the temple of God with idols? No. So you've got to be removed. Now, he doesn't kill his mom, but he takes her down a pig, a peg, sorry. He takes her down a peg and uh, removes her from her position completely. So she doesn't have any more authority there. And he also takes her image that she shut up, set up and um, destroys it. So that's really good. But then let's go to uh second Chronicles 16. Well, in second Chronicles 16, we're now in the 36th year of Asa's reign and some trouble comes up. So, Baasha, the king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, 
king of Judah. So Asa gets really nervous because Baasha, man, he's starting to uh, scare Asa militarily. So what does Asa do? Well, instead of turning to the Lord who said, I'm with you as long as you're with me, I'm with you. Well, Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and in the king's house. So he's bringing gold that was in the temple. And he sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus. So this is a king in Syria, Ben-Hadad. This is not a good idea. He takes, he robs God's temple to help to help bring security and safety to himself and to Judah. And he says, let there be a treaty between you and me as between my father and your father. So what harmony is there between Christ or between God and Belial, Christ and Bel? Nope. There's no harmony here. Don't be unequally yoked, believer and unbeliever, right? Why is that? Well, if you have a smaller oxen that is literally yoked to a bigger oxen on the side, the smaller oxen takes shorter steps than the bigger one. So what actually happens is that the bigger one ends up turning the plow. It's not able to plow a straight path because the shorter one is taking smaller steps. So you actually get pulled off course. Yeah, this is not good. Not good at all. And um, the Lord disciplines Asa for this. This is not good. It's also setting a bad example for Asa's sons as you're going to see later. Okay, so moving forward a few verses to chapter 16, verse 12, in the 39th year of his reign, this is three years after that treaty is made with Ben-Hadad, Asa became diseased in his feet. So the Lord let this disease came on him, come on him. Now, Asa could have cried out to the Lord, but he doesn't do that. It says that Asa, even in this disease, which was very severe, he did not seek the Lord, but only the physicians. Now, this is not saying there's anything wrong with turning to the, to the doctors. It's just that Asa did not pray. He didn't turn to the Lord. He only sought the doctors. He should have prayed. And so Asa died because of this. Now, the good news, you see in 1 Kings 15, 14, the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. So in a general sense, even though Asa um, turned to Ben-Hadad for military support, Asa was not an idol worshiper. He didn't turn to idol worship. He remained loyal in his worship to Yahweh. So that's good. That's good. Now, Asa dies and Jehoshaphat, his son, becomes king in his mid-30s. And at the beginning of his reign, it starts out great. So let's, we'll read, this is... Uh, Chapter 17, verse 3, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. So this is really good. He's staying loyal to Yahweh. He's not acting as Israel did. If you remember, like, the similar time period, you have uh, you have Ahab marrying Jezebel. So, king of Israel turns 
and marries a foreign woman who is the daughter of the king of the Sidonians. Uh, this is just horrible. And she turns the country toward Baal worship. Um, horrible stuff. Well, Jehoshaphat at first is like, nah, we're not doing that stuff. And verse five, the Lord established the kingdom in his control and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord and again, removed the high places in the Asherim from Judah. So this is just great. He's starting off very similar to his father Asa, getting rid of the idol worship, the high places. Um, he's following God's commands with his heart. I mean, he's, he's seeking the Lord, not the Baals. This is great. And then he goes even further. He gets into discipling his country, Judah. It's, it's his kingdom. So chapter 17, verse 7, then in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials uh, and, um, so you have Ben Hail, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, and Micaiah to teach the cities of Judah and with them, the Levites. So he's sending, uh, officials and priests, Levites, uh, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Ashael, uh, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and uh, Tobadonijah, the Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. It's a lot of names. They taught in Judah, having the book of the law, it's probably Deuteronomy, of the Lord with them. And they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. So that's just incredible work by um, Jehoshaphat. He's not just making, he's not just enforcing laws about no idol worship. He's not just enforcing the laws, but he's teaching the people the, the word. This is so good. He's trying to get to their hearts, right? Um, by showing them the word of God, helping them understand the word of God, not just the rules, but why. Um, just really, really good work from Jehoshaphat. And look at the results. Uh, you have results like from Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy like 28, like the, the blessings of obedience. Well, chapter 17, verse 10, now the dread of the Lord was on all the kingdoms of the lands which were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Some of the Philistines brought gifts and silver as tribute to Jehoshaphat. The Arabians also brought flocks, 700, sorry, 7,700 rams, 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat grew greater and greater, and he built fortresses and store cities in Judah. So you have lands from uh, the west, the Philistines along the coast, Gaza, you know, like they're bringing tribute and you have people on the east, you know, just beyond the, uh, the Dead Sea, you have them coming in and bringing tribute as well. Like they recognize God is with Jehoshaphat. The Lord is with them. And they're like, well, you know, we want to be aligned with you. Now, Jehoshaphat's not making treaties with them. They're just blessing him and they're blessing the Lord because of what God is doing through Jehoshaphat. There's peace on the east and the west. So then Jehoshaphat is growing in riches. And as he grows in riches, he grows more worried. He grows in anxiety. How do we know that? Well, Jehoshaphat, chapter 18, verse 1, had great riches and honor, and he allied himself by marriage with Ahab. 
Uh oh. So the East and the West, those are secure, it seems. But the North, well, you remember King Baasha, which I believe is Ahab's granddaddy, was coming up against Jehoshaphat's daddy, Asa. And this seems to be worrying Jehoshaphat. You got this presence still there. So I've got peace on the east and the west, but what about the north? Well, what if I could bring peace to the north? What could I do to bring peace? Well, remember, the prophets are telling Asa, they're telling Jehoshaphat, if you are faithful to the Lord, he's going to take care of you. But there's something about the deceitfulness of wealth that brings anxiety. And it causes us, a lot of times, to turn to the world's way of doing things. And it may seem very wise. It may seem smart to make this treaty. Um, but what happens when you marry foreign unbelievers? Well, again, you become unequally yoked, and it starts to turn you away from the straight path that God has called you to walk. So when it says he aligned him by self, uh, allied himself by marriage with Ahab, what's going on here is that Jehoshaphat gets his son, his oldest son, to marry the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Her name is Athaliah. And uh, what we're going to see later on, I'll just kind of, uh, spoiler alert, chapter 21, um, Jehoram, uh, Jehoshaphat's oldest son, chapter 21, verse 6 says, He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab did. For Ahab's daughter was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you're going to see it gets really, really bad. This is jo Jehoshaphat trying to make peace by breaking God's commands, trying to bring peace to his world, peace to his kingdom, peace to himself, by getting his son to marry Jezebel's daughter. What could go wrong, right? Horrible. All right. So chapter 18 has this whole story of Ahab coming to Jehoshaphat and saying, Hey man, I need you to come up with me in battle uh, against Ramoth Gilead and the Arameans. Not a good idea. But Jehoshaphat has already allied himself, aligned himself with Ahab. And so Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, sure. And they have a prophet come, uh, Micaiah, right? And Micaiah tells Ahab, it's not going to go well with you eventually, right? He's like, yeah, you're going to die. So Ahab thinks to himself, well, what can I do to ensure that I'm not going to die? Hey, Jehoshaphat, um, you wear all your royal robes, and I'm going to dress up like a normal dude, okay? So the Arameans had this plan. They're only going to fight against the king of Israel. They want to kill Ahab. But remember, Ahab is dressed in common clothing. Jehoshaphat's in his royal robes. So when Ahab and Jehoshaphat go out to battle. At first, the Arameans think that Jehoshaphat is uh, Ahab, just like Ahab wanted. Isn't that great? Let's have a treaty between the two of you. Now I'm going to set you up to die. Not good. Not good. But just as the uh, Arameans are closing in on Jehoshaphat, who they think is Ahab, Jehoshaphat cries out to the Lord. That's in verse 31. 
and God delivered him. So good on Jehoshaphat for crying out to the Lord and uh, praise God that God delivered him. And then just at random, somebody real, uh, somebody fires an arrow and it strikes Ahab and it kills him. So then Jehoshaphat, it's like, you know, narrowly escaped that one. Well, he comes back, he returns in safety to his house in Jerusalem. Now, this was completely unnecessary. That whole scene, Jehoshaphat should never have aligned himself with Ahab. He shouldn't have gone out to battle. This was horrible. And so now you have Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, go out to meet Jehoshaphat. Now, this Jehu, the son of Hanani, well, he came up earlier in 2 Chronicles. It was actually in 2 Chronicles 16. Hanani, Hanani was earlier. Hanani was a prophet who rebuked Asa. Remember how Asa relied on Ben-Hadad to help him? Well, Hanani came to Asa face to face, and he said, because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore an army of the king of Aram, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. And he's rebuke, he continues rebuking, And he says, look, Asa, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God wants to support you, those whose heart is undivided in loyalty, but you relied, you relied on Aram. You acted foolishly. And from now on, you're going to have war. And how did Asa respond to that? Well, he was really angry, and he threw Hanani in prison. And then he started oppressing the people. Well, that was not very good on uh, Asa's part. Well, Jehoshaphat knows all about this, and now you have Hanani's son coming up to Jehoshaphat. For one, good on uh, Jehu, the son of Hanani, because even though he knows what happened to his dad, got thrown in prison, um, he confronts Jehoshaphat for doing the same kind of garbage, you know, that his dad did. It takes a lot of courage um, to do what Jehu did. Now, let's see what happens. So this is chapter 19, 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2. Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet Jehoshaphat, and he said to him, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? Let's pause there for a second. From a Christian point of view, shouldn't we help the wicked? Shouldn't we love all people? Aren't we called to love our neighbors as ourselves? Now, but, but what is going on here? How do we, you know, Jehoshaphat could have, in one sense, helped Ahab. How could he have helped Ahab? Well, by rebuking him, just like Jehu's doing to Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat could have rebuked Ahab and said, you need to repent, you need to repent of this idolatry, and turn back to the Lord, kind of like Elijah did with Ahab and Elisha, right? That would be helpful, because that would be being a peacemaker. That is someone who declares God's terms by which they can be at peace, which is repent. And that kind of help toward the wicked is good because you are helping them know not to live for the short term, but for eternity. Not to live for the temple, but temporal, but for the eternal. That's, that's the best way you can help um, 
someone who is completely out of line with God. Like, you got to just think about the stuff that's going on today. What's the best way to help these areas that are at war? Financial, maybe, but you know what's a lot better than that? Telling them the gospel. Because there's only one name given under heaven by which men must be saved. And that's the name of Jesus. But these, the way that Jehoshaphat was helping the wicked and loving those who hate the Lord was to align himself with them. And what did that do? Well, Jehu, going back to 19.2 says, that brings wrath on Jehoshaphat from the Lord. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? It's not good, man. Not good. Don't be unequally yoked, believer with unbeliever. Don't do it. What partnership is there between light and darkness? He writes verse, or he says in verse three, though, Jehu does, but there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asheroth from the land, and you have set your heart to seek God. So in his worship, he's undivided, just like his daddy Asa. Jehoshaphat is undivided in his worship. And so God can still work with him. He's trying to make sure his people are not idolaters. The problem is that he's aligning himself with idolaters for peace, for safety. That's why he's going to encounter wrath, like worldly wrath from God. But because his heart is loyal in his worship to God, he doesn't have to be afraid of personally. As long as he's loyal to God, he's not going to suffer God's you know, eternal wrath. But because of the example that he's setting, he's actually setting his son up for eternal wrath. This is not good. Not good. So let's keep on going. So what did Jehoshaphat do after getting that rebuke from Jehu, the son of Hanani? Well, he didn't do, he didn't do what his dad did, which was to oppress, to, to persecute the prophet and oppress people. To his credit, Jehoshaphat doesn't do that. He treats that rebuke as oil on his head. He went back to Jerusalem. He didn't oppress Jehu. And he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, from the south to the north, and he brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. This is kind of like doing what he did earlier at the beginning of his reign. He's like... You're right. I've screwed up. I've been leading the people in a bad way by modeling a bad example. We don't need to align ourselves with idol worshipers, with unbelievers. Let's, as a nation, let's come back to the Lord fully. So good on Jehoshaphat there. Let's go to chapter 20. Okay, so now we're in chapter 20. Verse 1, it says, though, so Jehoshaphat's done wickedly, you know, aligning himself with Ahab, and so God's going to bring discipline on him. It says, now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with the Menunites, uh, Menunites, sorry, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are has his own Tamar, that is, they're in has his own Tamar, that's in En Gedi. So that's right uh, on the west, southwest coast of the Dead Sea, uh, west coast, southwest coast of the Dead Sea. So that is just east, um, not far east of uh, Jerusalem. Now, why would God do that? Well, in uh, Hebrews 12, verse 6, the writer um, says, For those whom the love, so, the, sorry, those whom the Lord loves, 
he disciplines and he scourges every son that he receives. So he's viewing Jehoshaphat as his son, you know, um, as his kid. And so he's trying to discipline Jehoshaphat. He's giving him another opportunity to choose right. Earlier when, you know, Jehoshaphat was afraid or scared, anxious, he turned to Ahab. Well, God brings him back to this same type of trial. He's got some anxiety, and now God is giving him an opportunity to choose correctly. He's not wanting to destroy Jehoshaphat. He's not wanting to um, bring wrath on Jehoshaphat. He wants to teach him to do right, and that's why this trial comes. A lot of times when opposition comes in our lives, we can look at it as God, like, why are you doing this? This is so you know, terrible of you to do this, you know, do you hate me? And God's like, no, I love you. I'm trying to train you um, in righteousness. So this trial is an opportunity for you. And I know it's so hard for us to look at it like that. I, I know I have a hard time, but God is disciplining those he loves. Well, this time in verse three, Je- Jehoshaphat learns he does the right thing. It says Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. This is, this is incredible. This is so good. He's like, we are going to seek the Lord together. We are going to call on him. We're going to defend, depend on him. So good. So good. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat, let's go to verse five. This is incredible what he's doing. And then you're going to see one of the best prayers. This is just an incredible prayer of faith and humility Um, it's so good, y'all. Chapter 20, starting in verse five, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and he prayed. Verse six, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out all the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, and we will stand in the, we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house and cry to you in our distress and you will hear and deliver us. Let's pause there for a second. He's actually like paraphrasing a lot of second Chronicles six when Solomon is dedicating the temple. Incredible stuff he's calling on. He's doing what, he's supposed to do. God's name is in this temple, he's saying. And so if we're being faithful to you and we call out to you, you're going to deliver us. You're going to hear from heaven and act. Noticing all the people, undivided loyalty are coming together there at the temple to cry out to God. Now behold, verse 10, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. O our God, will you not judge them? Now, Notice he's still clinging to this inheritance. He's saying, we're your people. We're your sons and daughters. We're not forsaking our inheritance 
you gave this to us. We value this. You know, the people in the north rejected their inheritance, people like Ahab. They're like, we don't, we don't care about Yahweh anymore. It's kind of like uh, what the writer of Hebrews says about the difference between Esau and Jacob, right? Jacob sold his birthright for some lentils, that whole thing. He didn't value his inheritance. Well, Jehoshaphat is valuing his inheritance. He's believing in the promises of God, which include the promises through Abraham that through him would come the Messiah figure. And then the promises through David that you're not going to ha- fail to have one of your ancestors, or sorry, one of your descendants sit on the throne, right? As long as we're devoted to you is a promise that God is making through David, you know, uh, to his descendants. Jehoshaphat is calling on all of these. Now look what he says. Again, verse 12, O our God, will you not judge them for, because, look at this, humility, faith, for we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Hold on, he's powerless. Why can't he just turn to the king of Israel again? No, he's learned his lesson here, it seems, right? We are powerless. We can't do this. We got nothing. I got nothing. I'm powerless, but you have all power. See that humility there? He's not wallowing in it. There's nothing he can do in his own strength, but he knows God has all power. God has the strength to do something about this. God will strongly support those whose heart is loyal to him. He's banking on these words from the prophets. We are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do. I have no answers, no strength, but I know one thing. Our eyes are on you. I can't do anything, but I know you can. I have no idea what to do, but you do. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph. So this is, uh, he's the descendant of uh prophet from David, who is like the leader of the worship team, in a sense. And um, he said, Jehaziel, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear, do not be dismayed because of this great multitude, because tomorrow Sorry, because the battle is not yours, but God's. God's going to do this. And God had promised, you know, the people as they're going into the promised land, you know, as long as you're loyal to me, I'm going to fight for you. Do you remember, uh, I believe it's in Exodus 14, when Pharaoh and his army are in front of the people and the Red Sea is at their backs and Moses tells the people, stand still and you'll see the salvation of the Lord. Very similar moment going on here. Jehaziel says in uh, verse 16, tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need, check this out, it's like Exodus again, 14. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Powerful. uh, Jehoshaphat was calling God to remember what God did, bringing them into the promised land, delivering them out of Egypt, all of that. And Jehaziel says, yep, stand still and see the salvation of God. O Judah 
in Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. So, what's the command that God gives them? Go out there and face them. But don't worry, because the battle is God's, not yours. Okay? That's all they're told. Go out and face them. So verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. He bows down and worships. Then the Levites from the sons of the Kohorites, sorry, Kohathites uh, and the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel the very loud voice. So they stand up to praise, they're blessing him, and they're bowing down at his feet. There's a very clear sign like of, of Psalm 2. You know, the nations are coming against the Lord and his anointed. But God in heaven laughs. He's like, I'm going to take care of this. And so what's the instruction from Psalm 2? Kiss the sun, which is uh, this worship the sun which is like bowing down to kiss the feet, basically, picture. And that's what's going on with Jehoshaphat. He's like, there's a real king of Israel. There's a real anointed one that's coming. I need him. I need God. Then they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. This is also kind of similar to Abraham and Isaac, right? God tells him, take your son, your one and only son, go to the mountain that I'll show you. You know, you're going to kill him. And Abraham rises up early in the morning to do this, to worship God. So verse 20, they rose early in the morning, went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. When they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, he addresses all the people, Going against this, against this vast multitude, he says, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. Okay? We're going to trust him. We're going to trust him. We're not going to be yoked with unbelievers. We're not going to do that. We're going to trust in God Yahweh alone. So verse 21, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. As they went out before the army and he said, give thanks. They went out before the, the army and said, so um, the worship leaders, basically, they said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come out against Judah, so they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with, their, with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. And when Je- Judah came out, came to look out of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and behold, they were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for God gave him rest on all all sides. Now, you know, there, just real quick, did God tell them to praise, and when they praised, then God would defeat their enemies? That's not the instructions. Why were they praising God? Did they praise God in order for their enemies to be killed? Or did they praise God because they trusted God? Just as a show of trust that God had already promised to do that. You know, did they praise to get God to do it? Or did they praise because God is faithful? It's kind of like Paul and Silas in Philippi in Acts 16. Why were they praising God in the cell? Were they praising God to get out of the cell? Or were they praising God because God is faithful even in the cell? 
there are worship songs that are like, we, when we praise, you break our chains, you know, stuff like that, you know. We praise God so that our chains will break, that kind of idea. That's not why we praise God. We praise God because He is God no matter where we are. We praise God not to change our circumstances, but because God is faithful regardless of our circumstances. Now, verse 31, so Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of uh, Shilki. He walked in the way of his father Asa and did not depart from it, doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. The people had not yet directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. So he's like, it didn't happen completely. He needed to keep on pressing into discipleship. So that's one thing. But also, when are the people, God's people, going to have completely united hearts to the Lord? Only when the real king comes. Jesus, right? Jesus is that real son of David, not Jehoshaphat. Even the best kings, Jehoshaphat, Asa, Hezekiah, right? People like this, even the best kings need the real king. They need the real king, Jesus, the real son of David. Now, um, I just want to uh, come back at this, at this time to chapter 21, because what happens after Jehoshaphat dies? Well, remember who his son was, Jehoram? Remember what Jehoshaphat did? He arranged a marriage between Jehoram, his son, and the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. What could go wrong? Well, when Jehoram becomes king, chapter 21, verse 4, when he had taken over the kingdom of his father and made himself secure, what did Jehoram do? He killed all. All his brothers with the sword, and some of the rulers of Israel also. So the Davidic line is almost completely wiped out because that's exactly what Athaliah wanted, because she's doing the will of her mother. Jezebel. Not good. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked in the ways of not King David, not Jehoshaphat, not Asa. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab did. For Ahab's daughter was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship have has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from the midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. 
and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What fellowship has light with darkness? As we come to the end of this message, we come to the time of fellowship with the Lord, communion with the Lord, who purchased us with his own blood to be a kingdom of priests in the world. If you've got your uh, bread, if you've got your cup, this is the time. We have the great king as our king, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. And Paul writes about the Lord, our king. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night which he was betrayed, took some bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the king is coming. And the nations will be enraged and make war against the Lord and his anointed. But, as Revelation 17, 14 says, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of Lords and He is King of Kings. And those who are with Him are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. Will you be faithful to him as he is to you? Heavenly Father, we again thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for sending Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. We thank you that he was faithful to us even in the midst of unimaginable temptation and suffering. And you, we thank you that he remained faithful even to death. And he was then exalted to your right hand. We pray that you would help us to be faithful. If there's anything in our hearts which is drawing us away from you. Show that to us. Reveal it to us. And help us to repent and cling solely to you. If there is any way that we have partnered with unbelievers, reveal that to us. Help us to do good to unbelievers by sharing with them the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, 
And thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us into truth and that sanctifies, sanctifies us and transforms us to be like you. Help us to walk as Jesus walked in faithfulness and wholehearted devotion to you. In his name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we've got one song left um, as a response song. The song is called One Pure and Holy Passion. Lyrics are, give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you to know and follow hard after you to grow as your disciple in the truth this world is empty pale and poor compared to knowing you my lord so lead me on and i will run after you lead me on and i will run after you as soon as we're done with this song, we'll be done for tonight. Thank you again for hanging out. God bless you guys. Give me one pure and holy passion. magnificent obsession give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you give me one pure and holy passion give me one magnificent obsession ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you to know and follow hard after you to grow as your disciple in the truth this world is empty pale and poor compared to knowing you my lord I will run after you Give me one pure and holy passion Give me one magnificent obsession Give me one glorious ambition for my life Know and follow hard after you follow hard after you and grow as your disciple in the truth this world is empty pale and poor compared to knowing you my lord lead me on i will run after you lead me on i will Follow hard after you To grow as your disciple in the truth And this world is empty, pale and poor Compared to knowing you, my Lord Lead me on, I will run after you Lead me on, I will run after you